I take it that the highest proof of Christ's power is not that he offers salvation, not that he bids you take it if you will, but that when you reject it, when you hate it, when you despise it, he has a power whereby he can change your mind, make you think differently from your former thoughts, and turn you from the error of your ways. This I conceive to be the meaning of the text, mighty to save. But it is not all the meaning. Our Lord is not only mighty to make men repent, to quicken the dead into sin, the dead in sin, to turn them from their follies and from iniquities, but he is exalted to do more than that. He is mighty to keep them Christians after he has made them so, and mighty to preserve them in his fear and love until he consummates their spiritual existence in heaven. Christ's might doth not lie in making a believer and then leaving him to shift for himself afterwards, but he who begins the good work carries it on. He who imparts the first germ of life which quickens the dead soul gives afterwards the life which prolongs the divine existence and bestows that mighty power which at last bursts asunder every bond of sin and lands the soul perfected in glory. We hold and teach and we believe upon scriptural authority that all men unto whom Christ has given repentance must infallibly hold on to their way. We do believe that God never begins a good work in a man without finishing it, that he never makes a man truly alive to spiritual things without carrying on that work in his soul even to the end by giving him a place amongst the choirs of the sanctified. We do not think that Christ's power dwells in merely bringing me one day into grace and then telling me to keep myself there, but in so putting me into a gracious state and giving me such an inward life and such a power within myself that I can no more turn back than the very sun in the heavens can stay itself in its course or cease to shine. Beloved, we regard this as sanctified by the terms mighty to save. This is commonly called Calvinistic doctrine. It is none other than Christian doctrine, the doctrine of the Holy Bible. For despite that it is now called Calvinism, is it could not be so called in Augustine's days, and yet in Augustine's works you find the very same things. And it is not to be called Augustinianism, it is to be found in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And yet it was not called Paulism, simply for this reason, that it is expansion, the fullness of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. To repeat what we have said before, we hold and boldly teach that Jesus Christ is not merely able to save men who put themselves in his way and who are willing to be saved, but that he is able to make men willing, that he is able to make the drunkard renounce his drunkenness and come to him that he is able to make the, disp the despiser bend his knee and make hard hearts melt before his love. Now it is ours to show that he is able to do so. Two, <clears throat> how can we prove that Christ is mighty to save? We will give you the strongest argument first, and we shall need but one. The g argument is... That he has done it. We need no other. It were superfluous to add another. He has saved them in the full extent and meaning of the word which we have endeavored to explain. But in order to set this truth in a clear light, we will suppose the worst of cases. It is very easy to imagine, say some, that when Christ's gospel is preached to some here, who are amiable and lovely, and have always been trained up to fear, in the fear of God, they will receive the gospel in the love of it. Very well, we will not take such a case. You see this South Sea Islander? He has just been eating a diabolical meal of human flesh. He is a cannibal. At his belt are slungs of scalps of men whom he has murdered, and his, whose blood he glories. If you land on the coast, he will eat you, too, unless you mind what you are after. 
That man bows himself before a block of wood. He is a poor, ignorant, debased creature, but very little removed from the brute. Now, has Christ's gospel power to tame that man? To take the scalps from his girdle? To make him give up his bloody practices? Renounce his gods? And become a civilized and Christian man? You know, my dear friends, you talk about the power of education in England. There may be a great deal in it. Education may do very much for some who are here, not in a spiritual, but in a natural way. But what would education do with this savage? Go and try. Send the best schoolmaster in England over to him. He will eat him up before the day is up. That will be all the good of it. But if the missionary goes with Christ's gospel, what will become of him? Why, in the multitudes of cases, he has been the pioneer of civilization, and under the providence of God has escaped a cruel death. He goes with love in his hands and in his eyes. He speaks to the savage. And, Marky, we are telling facts now, not dreams. The savage drops his tomahawk. Says he, It is marvelous. The things that this man tells me are wonderful. I will sit down and listen. End quote. He listens, and the tears roll down his cheeks. A feeling of humanity which never burned within his soul before is kindled in him. He says, quote, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, end quote. And soon he is clothed in his right mind and becomes in every respect a man, such a man as we could desire all men to be. Now, we say, that this is the proof that Christ's gospel does not come to the mind that is prepared for it, but prepares the mind for itself. That Christ does not merely put the seed into the ground that has been prepared beforehand, but plows the ground too, hey, and harrows it, and does the whole of the work. He is so able to do all of this. Ask our missionaries who are in Africa, in the midst of the greatest barbarians in the world. Ask them whether Christ's gospel is able to save and they will point to the kraal of Hottentot, and then they will point to the houses of Karuman, and they will say, quote, What has made this difference but the word of the gospel of Jesus Christ? End quote. Yes, dear brethren, we have had proofs enough in heathen countries, and why need we say more but merely to add this? We have had proofs enough at home. There are some who preach a gospel which is very well fitted to train men in morals, but utterly unfitted to save him. A gospel which goes does well enough to keep men sober when they have become drunkards. It is a good thing enough to supply them with a kind of life when they have it already, but not to quicken the dead and save the soul, and it can give up to despair the very characters whom Christ's gospel was most of all intended to affect. I could tell I could a tale unfold of some who have plunged head first into the blackest gulfs of sin, which would horrify you and me if we could allow them to recount their guilt. I could tell you how they have come into God's house with their teeth set against the minister, determined that say he would he would they might listen, but it would be to scoff. They stayed a moment, some word attest arrested their attention. They thought within themselves, I will hear that sentence. It was some pointed terse saying that entered their souls. The knew, the knew not how it was, but they were spellbound and stood to listen a little longer. And by and by, unconsciously to themselves, the tears began to fall. And when they went away, they had a strange, mysterious feeling about them that led them to their chambers. Down they fell on their knees. The story of their life was all told before God. He gave them peace through the blood of the Lamb, and they went to God's house, many of them to say, quote, Come and hear what God has done for my soul, end quote, and to quote, tell to sinners round what a dear Savior they have found. End quote. Remember the case of John Newton, the great and mighty preacher of St. Mary, Woolnoth? an instance of the power of God to change the heart, as well as to give peace when the heart is changed. Ah, oh, dear hearers, I often think within myself, quote, this is the greatest proof of the Savior's power, end quote. Let another doctrine be preached. Will it do the same? 
If it will, why not let every man gather a crowd round him and preach it? Will it really do it? If it will, then the blood of men's soul must rest upon the man who does not boldly proclaim it. If he believes his gospel does save souls, how does the account for it that he stands in his pulpit from the 1st of January till the last of December and never hears of a harlot made honest nor of a drunkard reclaim? Why? For this reason, that it is a poor dilution of Christianity. It is something like it, but it is not the bold, broad Christianity of the Bible. It is not the full gospel of the blessed God, for that has power to save. But if they do believe that theirs is the gospel, let, hit, let them come out to preach it, and let them strive with all their might to win souls from sin, which is rife enough, God knows. We say again, that we have proof positive in cases even here before us that Christ is mighty to save even the worst men, to turn them from follies in which they have too long indulged, and we believe that the same gospel preached elsewhere would produce the same results. The best proof you can ever have of God's being mighty to save, dear hearers, is that he saved you. Ah, my dear hearer, if it were a miracle, if he should save thy fellow that stands by thy side, but it were more a miracle, if he should save thee. What art thou this morning? Answer, quote, I am an infidel, end quote, says one. Quote, I hate and despise Christ's religion, end quote. But suppose, sir, there should be such a power in that religion that one day thou shouldst be brought to believe it. What wouldst thou say then? Ah, I know thou wouldst be in love with that gospel forever, for thou wouldst say, quote, I above all men was the last to receive it, and yet here I am. I know how. Brought to love it. End quote. Oh, such a man, when constrained to believe, makes the most eloquent preacher in the world. Ah, but, says another, I have been a Sabbath-breaker upon principle. I despise the Sabbath. I hate utterly and entirely everything religious. End quote. Well, I can never prove religion to you to be true unless it should ever lay hold of you and make you a new man. Then you will say there is something in it. Quote, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. End quote. When we have felt the change in it works in ourselves, then we speak of facts and not of fancies, and we speak very boldly too. We say again, then he is mighty to save.